Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. As once again, we have come together to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And God has blessed us with a great Lord's Day. Before we go into our service, I have a few announcements I would like to read. Please keep Sister Vonzel Hill's family and all of us grieving the loss of loved ones in our prayers. Special prayer this morning for Sister Linda McLean and Brother McLean as Sister McLean is back in the hospital under doctor's care. Continue prayer for Sister Emma Brown and her son Dwight daughter Bonita and her grandson, Demarion. Pamela Ely has requested prayer for Asiana Ely. Pray for her brother Amos Perry, who's at Cleveland Clinic receiving care from a recent fall. Sister Denise Draper requests prayer for her father, James Lacey, who fell and broke his ankle and is scheduled to have surgery on the 12th. Continued prayer for us dealing with health concerns. Remember to continue to pray for all of our sick and shut in and our ongoing prayers for our young people and those helping them pursue their education. These are all the announcements I have for this morning. On our roster this morning, we have Brother Greg Shields will be our song leader. Brother Donald Nelson will do meditation, scripture, and prayer. Brother Terrence McLean will offer the sermon this morning. Brother Ray Knight will lead us in communion. I will be back with the offering and the benediction and Brother Freddie Gibson will be the response facilitator. I'm Brother Frank Barnes, and you have been called to worship. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Fathers, once again, we approach your throne of grace and mercy, thanking you for this day, this Lord's day that you have given us to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we send up a special prayer for Brother McLean, and Sister McLean, who is dealing with an illness, that you continue to wrap your loving arms around them. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning. We, we haven't gone camping for a while. Let's, 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 let's do a little camping in Canaan's, uh, Canaan's land, all right? Is that all right with you? If you have it, let us go. <clears throat> I have left a land of bondage with its earthly treasure. I've journeyed to a place where there is love on every hand. You know that I've exchanged a land of a heartache for a land of pleasure. Well, I'm camping out. I'm camping in Canaan's happy land. Well, don't you know that every day I'm camping in the land of Canaan. And with rapture, I survey its so wondrous beauties, grand, oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise for I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land, and yes, I reached the land of promise with its scenes of glory, my journey ended in a place so lovely and so grand, I've been led by Jesus to this blessed land of story, or I'm camping. 
I'm camping in Canaan's happy land. Don't you know that every day I'm camping in the land of Canaan? And with rapture, I surveyed wondrous beauty grand. Glory, hallelujah, I will find a land of promise for I'm camping. I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Our meditation for this morning comes from Acts, the fourth chapter. I'll read verses 32 through 37. Acts 4, 32 through 37, our meditation. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said them, said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they all, they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and the, of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I read Acts 4, verses 32 through 37. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Habakkuk, second chapter, verses 18 through 20. King James Version, of course. Habakkuk 2, verses 18 through 20. What profit is the image that its maker should curve carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust it to make mute idols? Woe unto him who says to wood, awake! To silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. From Habakkuk 2, verses 18 through 20. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, you are holy and you are mighty. You are more powerful than all kings and royalty. Your goodness and your mercy exceed all measure. We give thanks to you, Lord, for being our blessed heavenly God. We trust you. We love you. We give thanks to you, Lord, for our church family and for preserving our loved ones who love you. Those members of our family who have been sick and those are members of our family who are in hospitals, not well. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you for using your power and your might to preserve the church family. Thank you for blessing those who love you, Lord. The, universe, the churches of Christ throughout the land and the country. But we especially Lord, thank you, Lord, for Brother and Sister McLean. Brother McLean, our minister, Sister McLean, his wife. We just pray that you'll bless her, 
preserve her, keep her strong. Help her, Lord, that she will be made well and she can come back and worship together with us. When we all are able to come back together in congregated worship service. We ask a special blessing, Lord, on Sister Hill and Sister Hewlin and, and her family, Sister Emma Brown and her family. Those names that Brother Barnes has called and those names that have been called in this devotion, we just ask a special blessing on Brother Lugo also, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for preserving us through this pandemic. And we thank you, Lord, for this group of men who have who enabled the church to come together in congregated fashion, even though it's over the air and over the waves. Help us, Lord, to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Bless us, Lord, as we come together in a congregated fashion. In Jesus' name, let us all say, Amen. Before Brother McClain comes uh, come to you, I, I don't know if I formally said or not, but uh, I know it's in God's time that he'll bring us back together, but I miss y'all. I sure do miss y'all. But um, Let's go ahead and sing this song um, before Brother McClain, uh, before Brother McClain comes. <clears throat> Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, 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 oh. let it rise. Let the praises of our Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our Lord rise among us. Let the songs of our Lord rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, 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 let it rise. Let the joy of the King, let the joy of the King rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let the praises of the Lord rise among us. Let it rise. Somebody said, oh, let it rise. of the Lord rise among us. We are certainly thankful to God Almighty for blessing us with the opportunity to once again come uh, into his presence through this virtual worship to worship God in spirit and in truth. We are thankful to all of our brethren who have led us in various aspects of our worship so far on today. Uh, Brother Frank Barnes, one of our elders for giving us the announcements and ushering us into the presence of God uh, as we have entered into our worship. Uh, Brother Greg Shields, another one of our elders who has led us in praises to God Almighty. And we're thankful to God, not only for his gift, but for his willingness to share that gift as we praise God, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of uh, the troubles that are in all of our, our lives. And we're thankful for Brother Donald Nelson, our third elder, uh, for the reading of the meditation, uh, and then, of course, the text for the message on today, and leading us again to the throne of grace and prayer. I, I thank uh, Brother Frank Barnes, as well as Brother Donald Nelson, for lifting uh, Sister Linda McLean in prayer. Uh, we certainly want to ask that God will continue to bless and keep her, and that she will be released to come home uh, very, very soon. Uh, we are looking forward to Brother uh, Ray Knight leading us at the Lord's Supper, and then again, uh, Brother Frank Barnes helping us uh, as we give based on how God has blessed each and every one of us. For those of you who are members of the University Church of Christ, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, for 
uh, this Sunday morning worship service. Those who are on the teleconference call, thank you so much uh, for desiring to be with us through these virtual modalities. Uh, thankful to those that we shared a Bible study with from the Sunday School Quarterly on this past Thursday. And of course, thank you to all of you who participated in our Wednesday night Bible class where we are studying from the book of Colossians. And, and we talked about avoiding deception. And for those of you who are members of our sister congregations who may be watching us, uh, whether in Cleveland, Ohio, Northeast Ohio, uh, throughout the United States, throughout the world, we've had people as far away as Africa who have commented because they have been watching us on Facebook Live. And we are just thankful to God that he has provided these modalities for us to use to continue to serve him and to get his word out to the world. Uh, and because of people like Brother Rick Winston, Brother Ray Knight, Brother Kevin Edmondson, and Brother Freddie Gibson, uh, they are using their gifts and their knowledge to help us uh, to do what we do best, which is just simply to preach and teach the word. And I'm just so thankful to God for their dedication, their commitment, and their love for God. Again, thank you to the elders for your support, your encouragement as we are striving to continue to feed our people, uh, the, even though we are separated from each other, uh, as far as geography is concerned, we are still attempting to maintain that contact because we are still members one of another. Uh, before we go into the lesson uh, today, I want to share with you a, a song. Uh, I have been accused of singing songs and, and not giving you the words to those songs. So I want us to sing together, if you will, with me, as the deer panteth for the water, and then we will go into today's lesson. And the words are here on the screen. As the deer panteth for the water, Lord, my soul longs after you. desire and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit desire and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver only. You can satisfy. You Anything 
Thank you. Thank you for joining me in singing that song. You know, there are times when I wake up on Sunday morning and it's just a song that's flowing uh, in my heart. No matter what's going on uh, in life, God always has a way of lifting our spirits when we sing praises to him. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you. Our message this morning is coming again from the book of Habakkuk as we continue our, our study. Brother Donald Nelson read verses 18 through 20. Uh, that is the scripture text that we had him read, but it's also the end of the entire text that we're going to study from this morning. We're going to study from chapter 2, verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 20. But verse number 20 certainly is the highlight of the text. Verse 18, what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake, to the dumb stone, arise, and it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Pray with me, if you will. Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day, for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, our prayer is that everything that we have done up to this moment has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Thank you for our beloved brethren who have led us in the various aspects of worship so far this morning. Those who will be leading us in other aspects when I am concluded with this message Thank you for allowing me to be able to collaborate with them and helping your people to acknowledge your worth in our lives. Father, I pray that I will humble myself before you, hide in the shadow of the cross, that I will seek only your glory, lift up Jesus, that all might be drawn to him, edify the saints of God. Father, would you use this message to prick the hearts of those who may not be Christians to help them obey the gospel before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Thank you for Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. He's our savior. He's our Lord. Because of him, we're able to come boldly before your throne of grace and prayer. Father, we also ask a special blessing based upon a text I received from Brother Douglas McHenry that you would bless his two daughters, Sister Sincere Ray Stewart and Charlene Golden, as they are going through serious health challenges, even at this very moment. We lift them before you as we have lifted the others whose names have been called, including Sister McLean. Ask you, O oh God, to be with those who are ministering to their medical needs. Use them as instruments in your hand for their healing in accordance with your will. Now, Father, we just pray that you speak through me, that we all will hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But the Lord is in his holy temple. We live with acknowledged frustrations and the limitations of human justice. 
In 2015, Oscar Gronig was sentenced for being an accessory to murder to over 300,000 people. Known as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz, he was intimately involved in the leadership of the genocidal machine of the Nazis. But since Gronig was so old and in such poor health and because his case was mired in appeals, he died before ever serving a day in prison. When he died in March of 2018, many threw up their hands frustrated with the obvious limits of human justice. Gronig, like so many others, seemed to just get away. It was like he filibustered the justice due to him. Even here in the year 2020, we have seen a number of injustices around our country. One of the more uh, popular ones has been in regard to Breonna Taylor and the fact that there were no indictments passed down for her untimely death. Martin Luther King Jr. says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Paulo Kelho and the devil and Miss Prim put it this way, in the beginning, there was only a small amount of injustice abroad in the world, but everyone who came afterwards added their portion, always thinking it was very small and unimportant. And look where we have ended up today. Even one of the founding fathers of our country, Thomas Jefferson said, when injustice becomes law, Resistance becomes duty. So as human beings, even in the 21st century and the year 2020, we are frustrated by the limits of human justice. Justice does not always seem to be done. The Bible acknowledges the limitations of human justice, but emphasizes the integrity and the perfection of divine justice. This truth serves as a bedrock for our faith. But this can be hard, especially when we're leaning heavily upon what we see. And in our passage this morning, God lifts Habakkuk's chin up a bit above what's right in front of him and shows him that, in fact, that he, being God, will deal righteously with the Babylonians. And this is the central point I want to persuade you of this morning. In an unjust world, we need to trust the God of justice who will prevail. To see this, we'll look at three foundation stones that will fortify your faith. First, I want to say to you, justice delay is not justice denied. Secondly, I want to say to you that sin reaps what it sows. And then third, I want to say to you that above the chaos, the Lord reigns. I want to repeat that for those of you who are taking notes. Number one, justice delayed is not justice denied. Number two, sin reaps what it sows. And then thirdly, above the chaos, the Lord reigns. Justice delayed is not just this denied. Habakkuk is still wrestling through his concerns over justice. He's been experiencing a disconnect between his expectations and his experiences. In chapter one, he rightly lamented the progress of the godless around him, but he wrongly impugned God for allowing it. God has graciously revealed his will to the prophet, and in summary, God has said to him, Habakkuk, you need to trust me. God still says to you and I in the 21st century, in the year 2020, you need to trust me. But what's so interesting here is what God said before he said, trust me. In chapter one, as Habakkuk is on the ropes, losing his voice, crying out to God, how long and why? God answers him not with a promise of relief, but a proclamation of sovereignty. But this declaration of sovereignty doesn't provide immediate relief for the people of Judah. What does it promise? It promises their discipline at the hands of the wicked Babylonians. When Habakkuk throws up his hands, confused and in a crisis of faith, God says, trust me. He tells them that he and 
All believers, all Christians under the new covenant must live with enduring faith. I talked about that last week. Even when things are difficult and don't completely make sense. I talked about that two weeks ago. If Habakkuk is buying that, there's still a lingering question that the bold prophet doubtless would be keen to ask. What about the wicked folk, Lord? What are you going to do with all these folks who are doing all these egregious things? What are you going to do with the evil people in the world, even in 2020? To this, God answers. And in verses 6 through 20, we see that the Babylonians, and indeed everybody, will receive the justice they deserve. Justice delayed is not justice denied. And while there may be limitations to human justice, there is no limitation to God's justice. The God of all the earth will do what is right. Oftentimes people think the Bible is an archaic book that is out of touch with what dominates our progressive and our sophisticated culture. There are people this morning even who consider the cultural hurdles evident in today's society to be too high for them to clear. That's interesting because this morning we're going to cover robbery and exploitation of others, excessive cruelty, sexual assault, and the belief that you can worship however you want. Are we going to be reading from the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer? No. Are we going to be reading from the front page of the Detroit News or the Detroit Free Press? No. Are we going to be reading from any other metal or any other journal in this country? The answer is no. We're going to be reading from the Bible, from the ancient prophet of Judah from over two and a half thousand years ago. And as we walk through these verses, I want you to keep something in mind that people throughout history abhor these types of practices. There's not a question whether or not the majority of people think such injustice is wrong. No, it's what can you do about it? What we see with the God of the Bible, what we see with our God and our Heavenly Father, not only does he see the injustice, not only does he say that the injustice is wrong, but God is actually going to do something about the injustice one day. But he's going to do it in his own timing and according to his own purpose. This is why you and I must live by faith, trusting the God of justice will prevail in an unjust world. As we look at this judgment, we'll notice some repetition. There are five woes in this passage. These woes are pronouncements of judgment that while we might not speak with the words of woe in our common vernacular, we do know what God is saying and what God is doing here. The woe language here is more of a mocking song that means to taunt Babylon. It is pointing out the folly and the certain doom of this nation. And so here in Habakkuk chapter 2, it's not a hope. It's certain. The mocking chant of these five woes are the opening song, the prelude, as it were, to the funeral service for the Babylonian Empire. Their time is up. And even while they are revving up their engines of death, God God has already prophesied their demise. In verses 6 through 8, notice what Habakkuk chapter 2 says. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his, how long, and to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for boodles unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. It's straightforward what they're doing here. They're taking advantage of the poor by gobbling up others' property. They would do this either by robbery or fraud. They plundered many nations, according to verse 8. And then they take advantage of those whom they conquered by extortion. They would take a number of pledges so the poor would need money. And then the Babylonians would take all of their stuff and give them a fraction of what they need. God is saying in verse number seven that there is a time when those who cause others to shake in fear will themselves tremble. 
It's interesting here to consider this in light of all of the political discussions about social and financial inequity, even in our day and age. There are important conversations to have, but while we may tire of the failed solution from the government, it's good here to notice the motive of this justice. It's an injustice, and the acts committed by the Babylonians are unjust, and why is this happening? It's because they are committed against other image bearers. It's not right to treat other people in this way. Why is it not right, Brother McLean? Glad you asked. Because it's an attack upon the glory of God and the dignity of man. There's a reason why we should care about those who have been financially oppressed, and it's primarily a theological reason, because God is reminding us here that while justice is delayed, it will not be denied. Babylon will pick up the check one day. When you look back at verse number nine through verse number 11, he talks about exploitation. Woe to him that covereth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. As they heaped up their riches, they built these great compounds as testimonials to their triumph. They are likened in verse number nine to live like eagles in a nest, high up and safe from others. They thought they were secure in their financial and military security. We might likewise grit our teeth when we see those in power seem to evade justice even today. People with lots of money avoid the prison they seem to deserve. Politicians leverage their influence to mitigate their crime. People seem able to cash in their capital in order to protect themselves. But even from the place of apparent security, the Bible here says the stones are crying out from the walls and the beams are crying out from the woodwork. It's similar to the rocks in Luke's gospel calling out when the Pharisees told Jesus to tell them, stop crying out Hosanna. And Jesus said that even if they were to be quiet, the rocks will cry out. When there's none to stand and do the job, the inanimate objects personify their disdain for this injustice. So too, when we see those apparently secure, not high up in their houses, but in the high positions of politics, those who are high up in corporate America, those who are high up in Hollywood or other industry, you and I need to remember that they can never be out of reach of the long arm of God's justice. While justice is delayed, it will not be denied. Babylon is going to hear the doorbell ringing and justice will come in. When you look at verse number 12 through verse number 14, they were cruel. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity? For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Here we read of the people who build towns with blood and cities with inequity. We can't help but think about our own country where so many people make money on vile things like sex trafficking, prostitution, child pornography, in other forms of iniquity. But then there's also the building of a country on blood. How many politicians receive lucrative checks? How many corporations and billionaires sign big donations in order to keep the murder of children in the womb legal? We call it abortion. The abortion industry in America is a billion dollar a year industry. The slaughter of children is as lucrative as it is, or it ought to be, repulsive. But even worldwide, 
we know that far from ushering in a utopia, the last century was the bloodiest in mankind's history. Despite all of the medical, technological, scientific, and military advances of the last 100 years, we have not entered a utopia. With dictators like Stalin and Hitler and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot, the 20th century was the bloodiest in human history. There are many countries that have a sad history of bloodshed. You may have wondered what will happen to them. Habakkuk is learning and we should be learning that justice delayed is not justice denied. Dictators and oppressors, the wicked and evil alike will stand before the judge of the earth and God will do what is right. Verse 15 through 17, talk about assault. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory, drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory." For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein. Here we're talking about the conquest of others and then either making them drunk literally or making them drunk figuratively on wrath. Either way, the point is they will assault them by making sport of them. It's an R-rated description here that involves gazing at their nakedness, verse number 15. This probably involves far more than the violet of looking. It's an unspeakable assault. But what do we read in verse 16? There's another cup to be served. The right hand of the Lord will bring judgment upon them. And even though it may seem in the moment like this type of thing is lasting forever and that justice tarries, we know that one day the oppressor will feel the weight of judgment. And then in verses 18 and 19, what profit is the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusted therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. God promises judgment upon Babylon and their idolatry. And while Babylon was a strongly pagan nation, it was not the only pagan nation. Someone has said God made man in his image and man has been repaying the favor ever since. It means that there are a lot of people who have made God in their image, which is but idolatry. At its core, idolatry is replacing the love and the devotion to the creator for supreme love for something that he has made. It's disordered love. It's a problem of the heart. It assesses God and says God is unworthy. To this God will judge. It's a good word for us today. We need to see that God does not just chalk up idolatry to a different type of worship. Idolatry is robbing God of what is his due. So God will bring clear judgment. We may be tempted to look around the world and see how people seem to be getting along well with their persistent denial of God's worth. And they may even see, seem happy while pursuing their gods with a little g. But we should be assured that there is a jealous God in heaven. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And one day, God has a hammer that will smash all idols. Knowing that justice is coming brings us encouragement amid the chaos. But it's important that I remind you 
that sin reaps what it what it shows. I wonder if you notice the surprising irony of this passage. You see how much of the sins committed by the Babylonians seem to come right back upon their heads. It's like sin has a boomerang effect. It's hardwired for personal destruction. There are a few examples I want to highlight in the text. In verse 7, we read that the debtors will arise and become the accuser. The one who took others for spoil will themselves be taken. Why is that? In verse 8, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. It's like a boomerang right back upon them. And then you look in verse 15 and 16, the one who makes others drink the cup of their judgment will themselves have their mouths held open and they shall drain down the dregs of judgment themselves. This needs to remind you and I, especially in 2020, and as we, we listen to the noise of uh, this election cycle, as we listen to and watch the noise on the news media and the corrupt television programs, we need to be reminded that sin is perverse. It's a dangerous mistress involved in the dark arts. It's the pursuit of promise, personal enjoyment and happiness. Sin delivers the scourge of death and of judgment. It's what the Bible means in Romans 6, 23, when Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we look at the text, it reminds us that sin is futile. God and his judgment upon sin actually injects futility in the pursuit of sin. It's as if God says, you don't want me, then you will get the nothing that you want. There's a built-in frustration element to all who oppose the Lord, as we looked at in verse 13 and 14. There's a frustration that builds within them as they attempt to find salvation in created things. There is a futility and an emptiness. Babylon is building itself up, but doing so wholly independent of God's kingdom purposes. But at the same time, and at a deeper level, God is allowing them to expand for his purposes. And then in the end, they will be destroyed for their rebellion. God will use Babylon to punish Judah and then punish Babylon for being usable in that way because of their iniquity. In spite of everything, the Lord will accomplish his mission. If you look at verse 13, behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? In spite of all the work, the progress, the accomplishments, and perceived breakthroughs, what's the point? The progress, this laboring and wearing, and this end is for nothing if it's not for the Lord. The self-seeking nations are doomed to futility. All is vanity. Life is fleeting. What becomes of everything that people have done? They have no desire for the kingdom of God at its center. I hate to burst your bubble, but America is not and has never been a Christian nation. It was based on morality and some of the principles from the Bible, but you cannot call yourself Christian unless you are Christians. God must be at the center. It's very important when we think about the geopolitics in our day. Just because a nation may be favorable in a relative sense, just because it provides nice benefits, there is order and there is opportunity doesn't mean that it is doing God's will. I get, I get so frustrated that we assume that when wicked and evil people get ahead, that it's because they are doing God's 
will. God makes clear that nations that do not have him at the center of their identity and existence will one day be toppled and fall. Self-seeking nations are doomed to fail. If there's no desire for the kingdom of God at its center, then they will be toppled by the jealous king. Now, this does not mean that God does not use nations. God does. Look at Babylon. But there's something greater going on. People should remember this when they wave their flags and they engage in political debate. Sin reaps what it sows. You must see that sin reaps what it sows, that it cannot stop God's agenda and surprisingly sovereign way it serves even God's divine plan. And this brings me to my final fortifying stone above all of this chaos, the Lord reigns. That's good news. You might not have said amen or hallelujah or whatever, but that's good news. Above all of this chaos, that frankly, I don't fully understand why it's happening. God still reigns. In the midst of futility of sin, the promise of certain judgment from God Look at verse number 14 in the back of chapter two. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In spite of opposition, the Lord's agenda is proceeding ahead and will accomplish its mission. There is a futility to sin. It reaps what it sows. Think back to the creation in the very beginning. God made man and woman, mankind in his image. And God told them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. In an ancient society, when a king would conquer a region, he would set up monuments or images of himself throughout the land to reflect his rule and remind his people of who he is. In a similar way, when God created people, he stamped his image upon us. He told our first parents to multiply, make more image bearers, and to fill his earth with all his glory. But you and I know that Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God. Man has been rebelling against God ever since, but it didn't stop God's mission. Sin does not thwart God. God sent another Adam. His name is Jesus. Paul in the second Corinthian letter calls him the second Adam. This Adam wouldn't fail. He came and lived the life that man didn't live, couldn't live, and wouldn't live. He perfectly reflected the glory of God and fulfilled God's law. And finally, he died upon the cross to pay the just penalty for image bearers who have sinned and broken God's law. What are you saying, Brother McLean? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Jesus died on that cross. He, he hung there, the just for for the unjust. They took him down off that cross. They put him in a tomb, buried him. And he rose again the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 5. When you and I hear the gospel, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. When we believe that gospel, John 8, 24, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Where I am, you cannot come. When we are willing to repent of our sins, as Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. When we are willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then we show our trust in Jesus through our final step of obedience, being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Acts 2 and verse number 47, 
It's then that we are added to the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Ephesians 5, verse 23 and verses following. It is through Christ, through this second Adam, it's that those of us who are in the church that Jesus promised to build in Matthew 16, 18, that he is the head of, that we are now spreading his glory through all nations. He sent us as disciples into the nations. And he does so with a desire to see more and more people come to Christ. God's mission to reach the nations with the gospel through the church is the unstoppable mission of filling the earth with the glory of the Lord. This knowledge here includes acknowledgement. People will come to confess him. God will make Christians the gospel alone makes Christians alone. He will cause people like you and me to be born again. And we know this is unstoppable. We've read the end of the book. What is the picture in the book of Revelation? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 through 13. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scrolls and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne that the living creatures of the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, where they is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and forever. Why do we read that in the book of Revelation? Because of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 13 for the earth will be filled with God's glory. All opposition will be on the trash heap of history. God will have the prime place. And the other aspect of the sovereign reign of God is found in verse number 20. There is a song, by the way, and, and many songbooks says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. We see a contrast in verse number 20. As he's talked about the idols in verses 18 and 19, that they cannot see, they cannot arise, they cannot act. The Lord is contrasted to these idols. The idols are fashioned by human hands, and even though they are worshipped by multitudes, they cannot speak, they cannot teach, there is no life in it at all. But in contrast for you and I, for Habakkuk, for Israel of old, for spiritual Israel under the new covenant. The contrast is the Lord. God himself, the self-existent author and sustainer of life, the eternal God, he exists and forevermore will exist. Notice where he is. We read he is in his holy temple. Throughout the Bible, the temple portrays the presence of God and the rule of God. The picture here is of God ruling over the entire world. He is sitting on his royal throne. He is the Lord God. In spite of all of the questions from Habakkuk and no doubt from all of us, we find the fact that God reigns. The Lord rules from his temple. There are a lot of question marks in Habakkuk chapter 1. But there's a massive exclamation point in Habakkuk chapter 2. The Lord reigns. You and I need to remember this, not only when we read the newspaper, but also when we lay our head down at night. 
or when we get the bad news in the morning or when our heart sinks in our chest, when things don't go as planned, when life doesn't make sense, when our question marks are piling up, we need to grab these three words and cling to them with all the energy that you have. The Lord reigns forever and ever. God is still sovereign. I want you to notice here that this temple is described as a holy temple. This is not a throwaway word. It's not trite. It's important. Holiness means both morally pure and transcendent. That is, holiness means there's no charge of impurity or imperfection. And by nature, then, it means that the one who is this holy is set apart and transcendent of everything else. God, then, is exalted. You know what makes this so arresting? It's the context. Remember Habakkuk in chapter 1. All of his questions, normally the prophets prosecute the people for their unfaithfulness to the terms of the covenant, but Habakkuk is prosecuting God for his perceived unfaithfulness. So in Habakkuk 1, verse 12 and 13, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, you've ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. Verse 13, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? This is why this statement in chapter 2 is so important. God is saying that his work of using the wicked Babylonians to accomplish his ends is not impure, it's not evil. But even more than that, it's consistent with his holy character. It's one thing to say that God is not guilty of sin. It's quite another thing to say that God knows about the wickedness of the nations and even uses it, not coincidentally, but intentionally for his most holy ends. How can God allow bad things to happen? This is a question that comes up all the time. Habakkuk is showing us that God not only permits them, but has sovereignly ordained them in order to accomplish his ends. The Bible nor logic would indict this as traceable to God as the source of the act, as if God were the author of sin. On the contrary, human beings are free agents who act according to their own desires. God is simply so sovereign that he can allow people to do what they want to do and then simultaneously accomplish his most holy, excellent, and gracious ends. We've seen this countless times in the Bible. God used Joseph's brothers to sell them into slavery in Egypt in order to save the people. They did exactly what they wanted and it served God's end. God used his Pharaoh in order to bring about the exile. Pharaoh did exactly what he wanted and it served God's end. He used the wicked Assyrians to punish his people. They did exactly what they wanted and it served God's end. He even uses these Babylonians. They did exactly what they wanted and it served God's end. And friends and visitors and brothers and sisters in Christ, God used the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders to bring about the the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They did exactly what they wanted, but it served God's ends. I say to you, God still sits in his holy temple. And what does God want us to do? How does he want us to respond? The verse says, let all the earth keep silent before him. You see, you and I don't like silence. We like stimulation. We like distraction. Silence is hard. But in this text, the right response is to be silent. How are we to be silent? And then this lesson is yours. First, we have the hush of fear. 
Who can stand before this God? He cannot be thwarted by evil. He's going to have his way. Even the most powerful nation of any age is but a tool in his ultimate plan to accomplish his will. What can we do before him other than keep silent? He deserves quiet fear. You see, this is going to be the response on the last day. There will be no excuses, no mocking, anything else that will besmudge his name. Every mouth will be closed and God will be proven to be true. There'll be no more question marks. Just an acknowledgement of fear before the Holy One with silence. But then there's a second hush. There's also a hush of gratitude. This is for the one who has bowed the knee in faith and repentance and obedience. If you come to the place in your life where you have seen your sin before holy God and seeing that he has come to unload his judgment, not upon you, but upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know that your sin has forever been cast into the sea, never to be found again. If you come to see that all your sin has been nailed to the cross and you bear it no more, you have a different hush. You are overwhelmed with gratitude and cannot speak. You bask in the rays of his radiant grace and his approving love. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. I was sinking deep in sin for from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, and now say, am I? Those of us who are members of the body of Christ, who've been added to the body of Christ because we've heard, believed, repented, confessed, and been buried in water for the remission of our sins and arise to walk in the newness of life. We can say that above all of the chaos we see and maybe even in some of the chaos we experience in our own personal and private lives that like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And like Job, we say, I know that my redeemer lives. And like Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor of things to come shall separate me from the love of God. To those of you who are not members of the body of Christ, who are not members of the church of Christ, who have not obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that you've heard me preach and you've heard others preach from time to time, and even what you've heard today, you can call us at what's showing up on Facebook Live, the telephone number to the church building if you live in Cleveland or connect with us at our website. And whether you live in Cleveland or not, wherever you are, we will direct you to where you will hear truth and obey it before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Before I close, would you, would you pray with me? And then Brother Greg is going to lead us in a song of invitation. Brother Freddie will be taking from the members' calls and prayer requests. But pray with me. Gracious Father, like Habakkuk, we admit that we don't fully grasp the enormity of our sin and what it deserves. Reading and studying this book of Habakkuk up to this point, looking at everyday people like us who'd gotten so tied up in sin, reminds us of our great need for a Savior. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our King and Redeemer. We thank you that he drank dry the cup of damnation that we might eternally sip the cup of blessing. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we as the church of Christ would be a people who are marked by trusting you even when things are difficult to understand. Help us, O oh God, 
to refashion our grip of faith upon you. You've proven yourself true and faithful in our salvation. Lord, we pray for the spoiling of Satan, the salvation of sinners, the sanctification of saints, and the second coming of Jesus the Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Lord, bless this message. Bless all who have heard. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Remember, for all of you are Christians, to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake as we sing the song of invitation. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Touch my eyes that I might see all your goodness, grace, and power. Stay beside me every hour. Be my drink, be my living bread. Keep me sheltered, keep me fed. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, dwell in me. We um, we have come to that part of our service where we commune with our our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, before Brother Knight comes, let let's sing the second the second verse of that song we just sung for the. Um, for the invitation. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, comfort me. Let my heart be one with thee. When I'm worried, soothe my mind. Let me sweet contentment find. May I run this wicked race. Feel by your amazing grace, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, comfort me. Our communion passage this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. I will be reading to you in part from the NIV version, the 53rd chapter. The prophet foretold of the coming Messiah, who would suffer many things for the remission of our sins. Beginning in verse 3, it said, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consent, considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and his words are healed. Let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious Father, again, we have so many things to be thankful for. And at the top of that list is the painful agony and death that your son suffered for the remission of our sins, so that we have the privilege to commune with the saints. Now, as we acknowledge the supreme sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, we ask that you bless this unleavened bread, which represents his broken body, and the fruit of the divine, which represents his shed blood. And we pray that our collective preparation for this communion service is pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up because he loved me? So he loved me so he loved me. 
so he gave his precious life for me for me all because he loved me so We have now come to the part of the service where we have an opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of what he has blessed us with. God's word says in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered him, that there be no, collect, no gathering when I come. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for all your many blessings that you have bestowed upon us and that you have let us prosper. We pray, Father, that we be cheerful givers as we give into your treasury, that we may help the cause of Christ and help others that are less fortunate than we are. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. As we go to the benediction, pray with me, please. To our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you once again today that you have given us to gather to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that you will be with us all, that you will continue to watch over those who are sick and that will be going undergoing operations this week, that you continue to place a hedge around us Keep us safe until the next appointed time. Pray that you will continue to bless your manservant, Brother McLean and Sister McLean. May you allow them to allow her to regain her strength and her health. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> On the wings of a snow white dove, he sent his pure, sweet love, a sign from above. On the wings of a dove, when trouble surrounds us, and the evil comes, the body grows weak, and the spirit grows numb. When these things beset us, I know he'll never forget us. He sends down his love on the wings of a dove, wings of a dove, on the wings of a snow white dove. He sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above. On the wings of 